Good morning, everybody. And my name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asia Institute. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome Professor Zhao Shui-Sheng, who speaks on a, on a topic with a very poetic title. It's the title of his latest book, The Dragon Roars Back, Transformational Leaders and Dynamics of Chinese Foreign Policy. This is a very, uh, um, a very timely book and a very timely topic. Uh, China has clearly been rising and has uh, majorly reshaped its foreign policies in the past decades. And uh, that has uh, uh, helped China in many ways, but it has also caused tensions around the world. And what the driving forces of that uh, reshaping of the foreign policies of, of China, uh, what they are, will today be discussed by Professor Zhao Shui Sung. Uh, Zhao Shui Sung is a professor and director of the Center for China US Corporation at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Dan Denver. And he's the founder and editor of the Journal of Contemporary China, a journal many of us know, and also an editor of more than two dozen books. And his most recent book, as I said, is The Dragon Roars Back Transformational Leadership and the Chi in Dynamics of Chinese Foreign Policies. Um, he was a postdoctoral uh, Campbell National University fellow at Hoover Institute, and he received his PhD degrees in political science from the University of California, San Diego. An MA degree in sociology from the University of Missouri and a BA and MA from Peking University. Professor Zhao, the Zoom is yours and welcome to EAI on Zoom. Thank you, Professor Hoffman, and also uh, Professor Chidong Tao, for inviting me to this uh, uh, forum and uh, to give me this opportunity to share my uh, just published, now I just published uh, already more than half a year, uh, a new book, The Dragon Rose Bag. And this book traces uh, the trajectory of uh, uh, China's rise and the driving forces behind it. Uh, when I give that book, book talk, or when I talk my book, people always ask me uh, why you wrote this book. Uh, uh, for me, the uh, uh, regions are two I mean, motivations. One is uh, empirical, this other is theoretical. Empirically, that I've been teaching a Chinese foreign policy seminar for many, many years. And, uh, but I have not been able to find uh, a comprehensive book of uh, Chinese foreign policy uh, covering the whole 70 plus years of PRC history. Most of, of uh, uh, books uh, on Chinese foreign policy has been, in my book, I talked about uh, uh, unidimensional and static. When I said that, I meant uh, they have uh, narrowly focused on China's bilateral relationships or certain geographical uh, areas and uh, certain issue areas uh, all during certain uh, historical period or contemporary time. A systemic investigation of uh, the dynamics of Chinese foreign policy over the 70 plus years uh, have been uh, mysteriously uh, naking, missing. Uh, so my book uh, provides a uh, historically uh, in-depth and up-to-date uh, analysis of foreign policy making in the PRC in the um, past since founding of it. Theoretically, uh, uh, two theories have been used uh, most often to explain China foreign policy behavior. One is a structural realist uh, theory, the other is regime type theory. Uh, structural realist theory uh, uh, focus on the relative power and argues that as, as China's relative power uh, uh, expands its uh, ambitions, uh, expand, uh, a more powerful China inevitably uh, redefine the national interest expansively and uh, 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 challenge the U.S. Uh, dominant position uh, in the international system and also uh, challenge uh, its neighbors in territorial uh, disputes. Uh, this theory may help understand China's recent uh, assertive behavior, but cannot explain 
the transformation of Chinese foreign policy in more than 70 years. Uh, when China's relative power was weak during Mao Zedong's time, uh, Mao's foreign policy was uh, very confrontational. And uh, he, in my book, I list uh, all the border conflicts uh, and PRC had during Mao's years. Uh, Mao fought six uh, border wars, including the war uh, in Korean, in the Korean Peninsula with the most powerful nation in the world, the US. And also fought, fought war with the Soviet Union and India. And uh, China supported those revolutionary insurgencies in many third world uh, countries. Deng Xiaoping moderated Chinese foreign policy, but China's relative power did not change that much at that time. And uh, he fought only one war with Vietnam during his uh, uh, tenure. Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao continued Deng Xiaoping's uh, moderate foreign policy. Although China's uh, relative power at that time increased dramatically, people talking about China rise during, during those years. And Xi Jinping's foreign policy has uh, become also very confrontational. He gave up those uh, moderate foreign policy, but China's economic growth has uh, slowed down in the last decade. So that's why scholars have argued that uh, China is overreached. When I say overreached, China has, Xi Jinping has set foreign policy objectives beyond China's uh, capacity. So that's the translation cannot be uh, simply explained by the relative power or structural realism. Regime type theory attributes China's confrontational behavior or policy to its authoritarian system. In, in that uh, context, only regime change can change or can bring fundamental foreign policy change in China. But China foreign policy has experienced many uh, turns and shifts, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but China's authoritarian system has remained. So my book, because of these two considerations, my book developed a leadership. Um, yeah, this is the page. Uh, my book developed a leadership-centered uh, framework to explain the transformation of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, it argues that uh, leaders matter in all political systems, but matter more in uh, Leninist authoritarian uh, systems, while elect leaders in democracies are constrained by opposition parties, term limits, pub public opinions, uh, uh, election cycles. Uh, uh, authoritarian leaders in China's Leninist one-party system, which emphasizes uh, discipline and hierarchy, in Chinese term, democratic centralism. And uh, their leaders are relatively unconstrained by those public opinions or any other uh, 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 constraints. Uh, the leaders, uh, uh, very powerful leaders, have also held a lifetime uh, tenure uh, in power. Uh, but the question becomes not every leader in the PRC history has uh, taken advantage of those uh, power, power positions to uh, uh, transform or chart new course of Chinese foreign policy. By official count, uh, in the PRC history, uh, China has uh, five generations of uh, leaders uh, represented by Mao Deng, um, Jiang Hu, and Xi Jinping. Um, but they missed uh, uh, three, uh, Hua Guofeng, uh, uh, Zhao Ziyang, and, and uh, uh, Hui Aobang. So I put eight leaders together and distinguished them into three types of uh, uh, leaders. One is what I call the transformational leaders. They are game changers and uh, have new visions and political wisdoms to navigate through the uh, jungle of uh, CCP power uh, politics and appeal to ideological uh, ideals to inspire followers. And obviously you can see in, in the chart, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping are typical transformational leaders. Mao Zedong set up what I called 
revolutionary foreign policy to make China standing stand up. And Xi Jinping uh, formulated uh, what I call developmental foreign policy to make China rich. And uh, Xi Jinping uh, has uh, developed a big power foreign policy to make China strong in his own terms. Second type is the trans transactional leaders. Uh, these have stayed in power, but also on the cause set by their predecessors. Uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao are typical uh, transactional leaders uh, and follow the Deng Xiaoping's uh, policy calls. The third type is failed leaders. Uh, uh, they lost power in the PRC uh, um, power politics. And uh, so in that case, who cares if they have new visions or not? Uh, three leaders here, what I listed, uh, Hua Guofeng, Hui Aobang, and Zhao Ziyang, are uh, so-called uh, failed leaders. Uh, my book, this the, from this chart you can see, uh, my book developed this leadership-centered uh, framework uh, and focus on um, three transformational leaders, uh, looking at their unique visions and, uh, and their political wisdoms, uh, our political power strategy here, you know, at least the personal uh, listic power or institutional po power and how they mobilized uh, ideational and institutional sources. Uh, when I say ideational, I'm talking about historical memories and national uh, list aspiration in my book and also institutional resources and strategically exploit international power distribution and uh, uh, world order. Here I'm talking about um, uh, rules, norms, and intuitions. Uh, so uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation, let me uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, discuss how each of these three transformational leaders have uh, charted uh, a new course. Uh, uh, leading to the rise of China today. Uh, the first transformational leader is uh, Mao Zedong. His vision, you see, I list all those uh, 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 aspects I discussed uh, uh, in the framework. Uh, Mao's vision, uh, Mao, was a, uh, Mao set up a revolutionary foreign policy and uh, he's based upon his vision or belief that uh, the PRC was born in an era of uh, imperialism. The themes of uh, the time were war and revolution because uh, when imperialism existed, war was inev inevitable and would lead to revolution. So he downplayed uh, the imperialist powers, including nuclear powers, nuclear weapons, as paper tigers and uh, his revenue po foreign policy confronted uh, hostile foreign powers in the defense of the China's uh, regime and the border security. Uh, his power and his wisdom. Uh, Mao established a very strong personal charismatic authority as the founder of the PRC and uh, in fact held power in his lifetime. Uh, Mao never tolerated any challenge, uh, anyone to challenge his authority and policy and purchase them ruthlessly, including launching the Kash Revolution to destroy the entire party state apparatus uh, that he believed uh, under the control of his uh, political rivals, Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Ideational sources, uh, as I said earlier in the framework, my book uh, explores two transforma uh, uh, transformational, uh, uh, how tra transformational leaders uh, manipulate the two sets of ideational sources. One is histor historical memories, memory, the other is nationalist aspiration. In terms of transforma historical memory, uh, transformational leaders have all uh, selectively remembered and draw historical lessons 
from the sharply contrasted experiences of uh, imperial glory and uh, the national drama of uh, modern humiliation to advance their foreign policy agenda. Uh, Mao Zedong uh, focused on the century of humiliation to mobilize the Chinese for his self-reliance to make China completely independent so that no external powers could humiliate China again. Uh, his attitude toward the uh, uh, imperial China was ambivalent because uh, the Chinese empires uh, expanded vast territories and left the controversial issues such as uh, territorial disputes and uh, complicating uh, relationships with uh, uh, neighbors. Mao also um, uh, developed, uh, uh, used Chinese nationalism. Uh, although his uh, revolutionary foreign policy was wrapped uh, with communist international list rhetoric, but Mao was a clearly a nationalist leader in my book. I made that very clear and uh, firm defender of uh, China's national interests. Mao followed both communist internationalism and Chinese nationalism when they uh, could be reconciled. And uh, 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 just followed uh, uh, nationalism. All nationalism prevailed when they are in collide. In fact, uh, my book documented uh, how nationalism motivated Mao Zedong uh, to enter the Korean War and also in a split with the Soviet Union, confronted both superpowers uh, simultaneously and uh, uh, finally played the US against uh, the Soviet Union. All those maneuvers were mostly uh, all um, based upon nationalist uh, uh, consideration. Uh, in terms of international uh, uh, sources, uh, uh, now, uh, institutional sources. Mao was a crusader, as I, the title said, uh, and made strategic decisions uh, top down and alone if necessary. Uh, he did not like bureaucracy. He, to overcome bureaucratic interference, Mao established a central foreign affairs uh, small leadership group in 1958. In fact, he built eight. Uh, in uh, small leadership groups, foreign affairs uh, leadership small group was one of them, basically to uh, cut through uh, the, the bureaucracy. In fact, he dedicated uh, 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 authority to Premier Zhou Enlai to deal with, to work with uh, bureaucracy. In terms of international sources, uh, uh, my book, I said my, I mentioned that my book examines uh, uh, the, trans the two aspects of uh, international uh, sources or international environments, how the transnational leaders exploited. Uh, one is international dis distribution of power, and the other is uh, wor world order of uh, norms, uh, uh, rules, and uh, intuitions. Uh, Mao was a uh, very shrewd strategist and uh, uh, really took advantage of, uh, I mean, very clear the uh, uh, exploit international uh, distribution of power. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, he took advantage of uh, the heightened bipolar rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union and made flexible alignment to reduce security threats. Uh, he leaned toward the Soviet Union against the U.S. Uh, in the 1950s. Uh, then he made strategic uh, decision to shift alignment uh, toward the United States when he saw the opportunity and uh, uh, saw the Soviet Union as uh, more threatening to China's security. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 Mao's um, uh, uh, attitudes or Mao's uh, maneuver, uh, in response to the international order, uh, um, Mao was discontented for sure uh, to overhaul the US net world order because uh, China was excluded uh, uh, from that uh, system. Uh, China 
regarded the United Nations, which represented this uh, international order uh, as a tool of, for the US to implement uh, aggressive policies and uh, to make political transactions, they call before 1971. But Mao expressed uh, a preference for, for one of the fundamental principles of uh, post-World War II order, that is Westphalian system of uh, uh, state sovereignty and uh, 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 diplomatic equality because uh, uh, he expressed his uh, five principles of uh, uh, coexistence because uh, China was weak at that time and uh, uh, sovereignty respects uh, uh, non-aggression, uh, non-interference in domestic affairs uh, uh, serve China's uh, uh, interests. Um, Mao, uh, so you see his attitude toward the international uh, order was very opportunistic and uh, uh, very strategic. Now we look at Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was uh, what I called a pragmatic strong man. Uh, then shifted Mao's revolutionary foreign policy to developmental foreign policy because he visioned, see his vision, he visioned that peace and development rather than war and revolution were the themes of his time. Uh, foreign policy was to create and uh, maintain a peaceful international and regional environment for economic development. And uh, in terms of his political power and uh, wisdom, uh, Deng was uh, uh, Deng never held the top party and government positions, but he placed his protégés, Huaobang, Zhao Ziyang, as the party general secretary and premier, and uh, to become a premier, um, a paramount leader uh, behind uh, them. Uh, ideational sources. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, in terms of historical memory, Deng Xiaoping continued to use the memory of the century of, century of humiliation to mobilize, uh, motivate Chinese people for power and wealth. Uh, he developed, but he developed a new historical narrative at that time that China was strong when China was open and draw deep into the achievements of other countries. When China closed itself, it fell behind. So then attributed the humiliation, national humiliation to China's lack of development and the popularized the historical lesson so-called the backward will be beaten, uh, so to set uh, to justify his priority of economic development and uh, nationalism. Deng Xiaoping and his successors championed what I call affirmative nationalism, focusing on an inclusive and a positive us. So it was a pragmatic, in fact, my other book also talk about this pragmatic nationalism to make China strong by any means. As Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it can catch uh, rats. So the party state managed in that case and maintained control of nationalist uh, expression and appealed to nationalism whenever it needed. And, uh, but also try to dismiss it whenever it, this uh, aspiration or sentiments threatened his foreign, foreign policy agenda, institutional sources. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was very different from Mao Zedong in terms of uh, using working with institutions. Uh, Deng was a consensus builder. He dedicated power to the bureaucrats to make routine decisions and ratify the decisions if they reach reached consensus. He stepped in only if they could not. Uh, so Deng for, oversaw a transformation uh, of China decision-making uh, toward professionalism and pluralization. And uh, so that's a very uh, uh, unique uh, way of Deng Xiaoping uh, working with bureaucracy, international 
sources. Not more they don't, then was a strategist and played the game of the strategic triangle uh, to uh, make China a balancing third force very successfully. And uh, China's uh, strategic position was not solely a function of uh, its military power, but demonstrated uh, uh, flexibility in his alignment um, practice, strategic uh, actions, Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong both practiced. Um, because uh, China, why, China, why, why China was taken seriously? Because China was the only major power to have uh, switched sides in the post-1945 East-Western confrontation, except Egypt in 1972. And uh, China was also the only major country to have engaged in military conflicts with both of the powers. And the only major country, again, except Egypt, to have, uh, to have been military aligned with both. Uh, so China's strategic uncertainty and flexibility on the Mao and Deng Xiaoping here continued, uh, limited the confidence in uh, Washington and Moscow that Beijing could maintain its diplomatic posture. And uh, so make China very significant in the strategic uh, game. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping's developmental uh, diplomacy or foreign policy faced the most critical challenge after the end of Cold War and the demise of the Soviet Union because uh, China's strategic leverage lost. In response, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping proposed a uh, so-called Taoguangyanghui, no-profile foreign policy to bite China's time uh, and uh, uh, push the fall. His, his uh, successors also pushed for uh, multipolo world and uh, promised the world for the peaceful rise uh, uh, of China. And uh, in terms of world order, uh, China developed, China became a uh, uh, active participate in international uh, in, in international economic institutions in the 1980s, and be benefit in, in immensely from the liberal uh, uh, economic order and uh, became a stakeholder in the order. But China still selectively uh, participated in uh, uh, sensitive international security and human rights. Uh, Regimes. Now let's move to the Deng Xiao, Xi Jinping year. Uh, Xi Jinping, his vision, uh, uh, his big power foreign policy uh, vision was uh, based upon what he called the China dream of a great rejuvenation without Fuxing. And uh, he tried to recapture China's uh, lost global power position. Uh, he declared a uh, profound change on scene in a century in which East is rising and the West is in decline and creating opportunity for China's inevitable rise. In terms of his political power and wisdom, uh, she was very quick to consolidate uh, his power with the consent of uh, the ruling elite because they complained that uh, Hu Jintao's uh, uh, leadership uh, was uh, too weak, and the factional backup of the connective leadership too divisive to curb massive corruption, and those liberal ideas uh, threatening the CCP uh, one-party role. So he used those scandals uh, uh, to purge potential rivals, uh, replacing them with uh, trusted lieutenants and uh, is established personal loyalty. Uh, to him as the most important political principles guiding the interactions of the political elites. And uh, I would argue in this book, I also argue that uh, uh, she became, has become the most powerful leader in the PRC history, especially after the 20th Party's Congress. Uh, his ideational sources in terms of uh, uh, historical memory in contrast to Mao and Deng Xiaoping, she has become more willing to celebrate China's imperial glory to boast nationalist uh, pride 
and uh, to realize China's dream of uh, national rejuvenation. Uh, but what in, there's a chap chapter in my book talk about what Xi Jinping has celebrated is a reinvention of imperial China uh, as the beloved center of East Asia. It's a reconstructed historical memory for sure. Uh, nationalism, uh, she has moved beyond affirmative nationalism and a patriotic struggle to target elective others and Western values. So Xi Jinping has nurtured a new generation of uh, nationalist, uh, nationalist intolerant to any criticism of the PRC or CCP regime and uh, very hostile to the Western uh, powers and the values. Uh, intuitional uh, sources, uh, Xi Jinping also is different from his other predecessors, especially from Deng Xiaoping, because he proposed uh, what, what he called Ding Chen Seji, uh, top level design and recentralized policy making authority to the party center with himself as the call. Uh, uh, in my book, I talked a lot about uh, how he, in particular, uh, um, strengthened the coordination uh, intuitions and set up those uh, new uh, leadership small groups. Uh, with himself as the head to bypass entrenched interests and cut through uh, bureaucratic uh, roadblocks. In this process, uh, he politicized uh, foreign policy bureaucracies and emphasized political loyalty uh, over professionalism. Uh, he also expanded uh, common party uh, and di and diplomacy, asserted, asserted his authority over the military and diplomacy. So Xi Jinping has become a micromanager, uh, chairman, known as the chairman of everything. His international uh, sources, uh, uh, she is not as strategic as Mao or even as Deng. And uh, he abandoned uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, developmental moderation. And uh, his, his big power diplomacy has uh, proactively shaped, try to shape international environment rather than passively reacting to it. And uh, uh, while she and uh, he has talked about Duo Jihua, multipolarization in the world, uh, multipolarity in the world, but his uh, uh, big power foreign policy has focused or centered on the competition with the United States because uh, he believes that U.S. will never accept China's uh, rise and the U.S. strategy will be uh, uh, strengthen uh, or contain China's rise. So containment and the counter containment will be the main theme of uh, his foreign policy all his time. So in that case, Xi Jinping emphasized uh, the fighting spirit and uh, try to emphasize baseline thinking now is a limit uh, uh, nine thinking, we now even talking about, and demand the US respects China's uh, uh, core national interest, which is defined as uh, uh, non-negotiable and uh, cannot be compromised uh, because it is bottom line of national survival. And uh, so uh, the, competition with US uh, has uh, become the central line of his big power diplomacy and uh, affected all aspects uh, of uh, Chinese foreign policy and also international politics and uh, caused significant uh, global power realignment. And uh, in fact, uh, 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 bipolar, Bipolarity has emerged in this in this uh, in this cause. In response, Xi Jinping has tried to build a uh, anti-hegemonic coalition or united front against uh, the United States and its allies. And uh, in terms of uh, world order, 
uh, she has challenged uh, the U.S. net order as unfair and unreasonable enough to reflect the interests and the values of uh, emerging powers, especially uh, China. And uh, so he tried to present Chinese version uh, to reform uh, the world order. And uh, the most important his uh, uh, reform vision was so he, he called uh, uh, the community of shared future for the community for the mankind, uh, which rejects the Western values as universal and called for social political systems to be respected as equally valid. And uh, democracy should not transform uh, uh, authoritarian uh, values and uh, they should respect uh, uh, coexist together. That's what he's uh, uh, thinking of the international order. And uh, in that case, uh, China is no longer a simple stakeholder, has become a revisionist power. Or I can, in my book, I call it a revisionist stakeholder. And uh, expressing his revisionist uh, demands, Xi Jinping has unveiled many new initiatives, such as AIB, the BII, uh, Global uh, Development, Development Initiative, uh, Global Security Initiative, and Global Civilization Initiative. And uh, he evolved to show Chinese characters and Chinese style, Chinese uh, ambition, and provide Chinese solution uh, to the uh, reform of the Chinese uh, international order. In fact, in the past, China only called for participate in the international uh, order or change in the order. Now he tried to take lead in this process. He uh, uh, called for two guides, guide the international community to build a more just and reasonable order and uh, guide the international community to safeguard international security. Uh, Wang Yi used the term Lin Tou Yang. China should become a lead, leading goat and, uh, to guide the reform of international governance. So that's a very big cha uh, change. So China has, uh, Xi Jinping in fact, has rejected the concept of the rules-based order and defined and imposed in his mind by the US uh, and other Western countries and uh, demanded greater representation and voices, uh, uh, including sh voting shares in the national institutions. Uh, China is a UN Security Council permanent member, but <laughs> China has also taken a lot of leadership positions in the UN specialized uh, agencies. In fact, that among the 15, China already took four today, uh, uh, has four today. And uh, so a lot of people in the world have alarmed that uh, China's uh, rise and objection to the liberal values uh, have amounted to an essential uh, threat to the post-war II order. Uh, but in my book, I try to uh, assess these uh, 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 argument and uh, uh, find that uh, the world has not rushed to China at order because China can hardly mobilize enough resources to provide swiping international um, uh, public goods or offer alternative values universally accepted uh, to rewrite rules and norms of world order. And uh, the US leadership now is uh, challenged for sure, uh, but China has not demonstrated its global leadership and uh, to meet global challenge. And uh, that's, um, uh, what we see China's current status on the Xi Jinping uh, international uh, um, um, posture. Now, in, conclude, in conclusion, I raised some, several questions to see if uh, my book will lead uh, my audience uh, to think about what is China's future as a great power on the current leadership of Xi Jinping. Uh, what are the intended and unintended consequences of uh, increasingly uh, assertive uh, foreign policy under Xi Jinping, especially uh, under his power concentration um, uh, in the making of foreign policy. And uh, uh, do we uh, come to a world disorder 
when China cannot not take leadership and the US is challenged. And so those are the questions I raised. I don't have answers myself, just want you to think. I think I've talked too long, uh, 45 minutes. That's about the time allocated <laughs> for me. So I turn the torch back to Professor Hoffman and thank you all for your patience to listen to me. Well, thank you so much, Professor Zhao. This was uh, very fascinating and, and uh, comprehensive. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions. The uh, way to get my attention is to raise your uh, hand electronically under reactions, you have a raise hand function. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I, I maybe to start things off, I, I would, uh, my, my, so you, you, you on the personalities uh, in the formulation of the of the uh, foreign policies, but but uh, I mean the personalities are re are really sitting on top of a, an extensive uh, machinery of foreign policy making, if you want. And and to what extent do you think that, especially under Xi Jinping, and let's focus on one, uh, the the machinery of foreign policy making in the CPC, but also in the government plays a role in shaping those concepts, or is this really all Xi Jinping thought? Professor Zhao. Yeah, I think it's um, now most Xi Jinping thought and the Xi Jinping's visions have uh, guided uh, the machine. You talk machine, I use the, uh, uh, it talking about political uh, uh, policy making institutions. In fact, uh, uh, in my book, I list three novels of uh, three tiers of policy making intuitions uh, under uh, the paramount leader. In this case, under Xi Jinping, I have a chart also for the policy making uh, hierarchies. Hierarchy at the uh, uh, top uh, are those policy making coordination, uh, policy coordination and consultation intuitions, uh, uh, and now called as leadership small groups in the foreign policy uh, arena. Foreign policy leadership small group. Now has under Xi Jinping has been uh, upgraded in the foreign policy, uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, uh, commission. Himself is the uh, chair, and Wang Yi is office director. It's, it's see how level, how high level, how level, how high that level of intuition is. These are uh, opaque behind the scene intuitions, but they played a role to coordinate on the foreign policy making issues, especially those uh, um, pressing issues in an interdepartmental uh, manner. Uh, um, uh, below that uh, is the uh, foreign policy uh, uh, bureaucracies. Uh, oh no, the at top is foreign policy making, in, uh, uh, foreign policy decision making institutions, Politburo, Politburo Standing Committee. The next is uh, coordination institutions. The third is uh, uh, bureaucracies at party uh, government and the military. You can see Xi Jinping has a totally restructured uh, this institution at three level, institution setting at three levels. At the Politburo, Politburo Standing Committee, he has placed all his uh, bodies uh, there. And uh, in the coordination institutions, he has uh, centralized uh, those leadership small groups and built new ones and uh, headed all those uh, by himself uh, and uh, used those kind of also central foreign affairs uh, uh, conference uh, to unite the thinking of Chinese uh, uh, top elites. And in the bureaucracy, as uh, I mentioned briefly in the presentation, that uh, for many years, uh, uh, before Xi Jinping, uh, Chinese uh, foreign uh, Chinese diplomats uh, were recognized or presented themselves as the uh, professionals. But uh, uh, when they became more more professionalized, they are more less important their political status, like foreign ministry, foreign affairs ministry, and uh, so morale, morale, everything was uh, damaged. In my book, talk about that. And uh, Xi Jinping came to reverse that trend, but emphasized political loyalty uh, over professionalism as the most important requirement 
for the Chinese bureaucrats. So in that context, you see at all three levels, his personal visions and the personal will have guided the foreign policy making for very sure, very clear in this process. And when maybe you did not ask, but let me also uh, uh, mention that, that the consequence is very, very dangerous because uh, this kind of personalization of the Chinese foreign policy. Uh, in fact, the qu question I raised uh, my, uh, and, uh, at the end uh, could lead to a bubble in a policy making um, process. Nobody would dare to tell him uh, if he makes uh, wrong decisions. Nobody dares to uh, disagree with him. Everybody just guess what he wants, what's in his mind. So that could lead what I uh, worried about unintended, un unintended uh, adventure of low return for Chinese foreign policy making. So that's, the, I don't know if I answered your questions. questions. You more than answered my question. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, anybody feel free to switch on your camera. And then we have a view that there's many more people in the Zoom and that we have about 60 people. So that would be nice. Uh, uh, Dr. Chi Dong Tao has a question, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Zhao, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm especially interested in your comparison between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Mao Zedong, the two uh, very important transformational leaders. Uh, you argue that actually uh, Xi Jinping is more powerful than Mao Zedong. Uh, I'm not sure whether everyone would agree with you uh, can you elaborate on this point? Because uh, 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 yeah. because you, you mentioned that Mao Zedong was very much uh, confrontational. Uh, it seems uh, it uh, some it has some uh, kind of association between his confrontation or confrontational thinking and his power, right? Uh, but Xi Jinping, do you think Xi Jinping is as confrontational as uh, Mao Zedong, uh, especially on the Taiwan issue? Uh, if, uh, you know, uh, do you think Xi Jinping uh, has the determination to, uh, to start a war against Taiwan and the United States if the situation turns really bad for China? Thank you. Um, when I said Mao, um, Xi Jinping is more powerful, I'm talking about his institutional and personal uh, authority. Uh, he has uh, um, personally controlled all the political or policy making institutions, which are more was more kind of uh, uh, hands off, that uh, Zhou Enlai and uh, his uh, other comrades to do that. And uh, also in, in, in terms of institutional authority here, uh, Mao was uh, uh, checked, uh, balanced by his comrades, like uh, uh, Yu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, and many revolutionary uh, veterans uh, fighting together with him. And uh, uh, after him, Deng Xiaoping was balanced by Chen Yun, and uh, uh, Jiang Zemin was balanced by Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao was balanced by uh, uh, Jiang Zemin. Nobody now in the Chinese uh, 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 Chinese uh, among Chinese elites, our leadership is in a position to balance Deng Xiaoping or, che uh, or uh, Xi Jinping or check Xi Jinping. So from that perspective, personally and institutionally, he is much more powerful. And uh, but uh, in fact, you raised another question here: uh, uh, confrontational uh, foreign policy. Uh, Xi Jinping and uh, compare confrontational foreign policy between Xi Jinping and uh, Mao Zedong. Both are confrontational for sure. But Mao was much, much more strategic and flexible uh, in, uh, than Xi Jinping today. Uh, Mao, uh, you talk Taiwan issue. Mao was very clear we have to take, he had to take back Taiwan. But uh, he did not want to confront the United States. Uh, in 1954, 1959, Jingmen uh, bombardment, and he tried everything to avoid to uh, bomb American ships. 
and uh, all his strategy was to uh, have a notes to tie Taiwan to mainland China. It was not to take back Taiwan at all. Never thought he would take back Taiwan in his lifetime. He even talked about he could wait for 100 years, in, and even during the normalization process uh, with the United States in 1970s. So Mao was much, much more flexible, much more uh, strategic than Xi Jinping. And uh, Xi Jinping is confrontational, but not that strategic. So people have uh, so much concern, so many concerns about you talk about Taiwan issue. We don't know if she would uh, uh, use force. Uh, because he does not know himself either at this point. And uh, in this kind of decision-making environment, we cannot use rational uh, decision-making model uh, to understand um, his decision on Taiwan issue because uh, uh, the cost benefit calculation uh, could not apply to him. Uh, it's very subjective to him. Uh, outside, we see very uh, use of those uh, uh, cost uh, uh, and also capacity uh, to calculate if uh, it's uh, in his capacity, if in his interest to do so. But uh, in this type of uh, environment of uh, decision making, people just guess what is in his mind if he wants. All his military journals will tell him we can take Taiwan in 24 hours although they could not. So that's the problem in terms of uh, his uh, 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 confrontational or adventure uh, foreign policy making process. That's what I'm concerned. Um, I'd like to add that of course, she is much more powerful in terms of the command over uh, a much larger economy and a much stronger military. Uh, Dr. Chang'an. Yeah, hi, uh, Professor Zhao. Uh, nice to see you again online. Yeah, you look very well. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> about the Xi Jinping's uh, foreign policy, uh, my observation is that actually even for his policy, uh, it has been changing over the years since the start of his, uh, uh, his, his power. Um, I think in the, in the first few years, actually, the foreign policy style is not uh, like what it what we are seeing uh, today, um, uh, and also I think uh, during his uh, uh, his term, uh, second term, I think he he even had a, asked Liu He to have a kind of a, a tariff uh, a degree a tariff uh, agreement with the United States just before the pandemic. So I think there are still some kind of cooperation and compromises between the uh, two countries. Uh, so my question is that, uh, 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 how do you think about the future of uh, China's policy towards the United States? Do you think they will, uh, it will become more and more aggressive uh, and hostile towards the U.S., or there's still room for some kind of uh, adjustment? Because in, in recent uh, uh, weeks, we see some kind of high-level exchanges between the two countries. Um, and uh, Foreign Minister Qing Gang uh, has not show, shown up for, <laughs> for several weeks. So we don't know why. Is it really because of his health problem or there's a kind of debate uh, uh, over the, uh, the foreign policy? Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, what's the difference between him and uh, Qing Gang and uh, Wang Yi, for example? Now Wang Yi takes charge and he's now in the uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, instead of Qing Gang, yeah. So, so can you help us explain all you, this? Yeah. You raised two questions. Uh, first, uh, is uh, if there is a change in Xi Jinping's yes. foreign policy. Second, uh, what is the uh, development of a U.S.-China confrontation? So, I think those are two questions you raised. Yeah. In terms of first question, indeed, uh, he has uh, made some adjustments in. China's foreign policy, but his vision, that's what I emphasize in my book, has never changed. Even before he took office, he went to Mexico, uh, told Chinese uh, embassy people that those Western, that those Westerners uh, um, uh, well fed uh, had nothing to do but to point fingers on China. So that showed his um, 
uh, confrontational uh, attitude toward the Western countries, and also showed his determination to uh, uh, restore China's big power and position. So that's why the uh, same year when he took the it's only same month when he took the secretary general general secretary position, he went to the Chinese Chinese History Museum to propose the China dream, which is his vision. I as I uh, mentioned, that has never been changed. But he, as you said, his uh, foreign policy has been constantly uh, in adjustments uh, during his first term. And people did not, another people did not realize uh, his uh, uh, confrontational and what the Chinese dream meant for his Chinese foreign policy, for China relationships with the US and the other countries, because uh, he was still in the process of consolidating his power and uh, in the process of mobilizing all those institutional and uh, ideational uh, sources, as I discussed in my book, and also in a constant reassessment, uh, China's uh, uh, relative power uh, in the international distribution of power, China's uh, 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 position and taught those international institutions and norms, uh, roles. So that's what we see in the adjustment. But uh, uh, when he once he consolidated his power, uh, his uh, visions uh, demonstrated so clearly in the uh, Chinese foreign policy uh, making in the other confrontational position. In fact, uh, even during the second term, uh, uh, he, he thought China was already overtook the United States, he became so confident. Uh, Huang Gangno's type of uh, China overtook the uh, US uh, 2014, 2015, already became popular and also got his ears, in fact. Uh, so uh, that's how he talked about uh, the uh, uh, profound uh, change unseen in a century took place, the rise of China and decline of the West, everything. He believed in those and uh, Chinese foreign policy became so uh, uncompromising uh, toward the United States. US uh, in the past, China makes so many compromises uh, to the US on uh, uh, trade, everything. Now. Uh, U.S. Uh, had to make reciprocal uh, uh, accommodation to China for China to make accommodation to China to the U.S. So have to be mutual uh, now, and uh, so that's how we see that U.S. Uh, China relationship come to today's uh, competition or rivalry uh, stage, and. Uh, you ask the second question here, in, in that context, what is the future? I don't think China is uh, ready to make any significant compromise. And uh, in Xi Jinping mind, two things. One is China rise is inevitable, for sure. He has to push that forward. Second, uh, whatever China acts, the US would not want to accept China's rise. We are, U.S. will do everything to undermine China's rise. So in that context, China has no room to compromise and uh, China has to fight. Uh, yeah, that's why you see uh, the U.S. called for uh, 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 safe uh, uh, yard uh, to, save, uh, to, to set up a um, uh, uh, guardrail and uh, set up uh, uh, communication channels, opened up communication channels. China really did not respond to those uh, very enthusiastically. And the U.S. has sent the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Treasury, now the, the uh, John Kerry uh, uh, climate change rep envoy to China. But China did not uh, uh, took any uh, reciprocal actions so far. And uh, these trips, communications has become kind of a exchange of accu accusations and uh, instead of finding resolutions so far. And uh, uh, China will say, you have to send those uh, people to China will not uh, resolve the problems. You have to uh, um, uh, lift all the sanctions, uh, lift all 
uh, those uh, technology uh, uh, restraints, everything. And uh, I don't think those will happen uh, in the, on the US side. This side, this environment is also very, very difficult. On the South China Sea, on Taiwan issues, and I don't, also don't see uh, any rooms for com uh, compromise on both sides. So in that context, I hope the uh, communication itself is better than no communications for sure. But those communications have not uh, helped to stabilize the relationship so far. So uh, I'm not optimistic about the relationship and this for the near future. future. Uh, sorry to interject, but I, I don't want to leave you on that on that very pessimistic tone. So what what would need to change so that the dynamics would go in a different direction? What would need to change for China and or the United States to come to a more compromising uh, cooperative uh, international policy? Uh, several things I think they could do at this time. Uh, one is that uh, both sides, I mean, now the competition is not only a power competition, but also uh, uh, a competition between democracy and the autocracy, ideological, everything uh, involved. And uh, so both sides at this time should try to find ways to live with each other. Uh, in fact, uh, I like Susan Shirk's argument that China has overreached and the US has overreacted. And so if China tries to understand uh, its overreach, uh, setting up the uh, foreign policy objective beyond its capacity, try to um, uh, moderate, I was thought maybe not moderate, uh, try to find ways uh, to reduce those tensions, uh, especially on the China side. U.S. complained all those uh, economic, I mean, business aspects and the political aspects, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, all those issues, which I think are very difficult, I know, but on those issues. And while U.S. Uh, try to not overreact to China because China is not in a position to replace US anytime soon. So US uh, will recognize uh, China's uh, current uh, status as a rising power and uh, its legitimate uh, demands uh, on its uh, uh, rightful, so-called rightful uh, um, position and uh, its developmental interests and uh, not uh, to uh, politicize those ideological uh, uh, differences. So that's one thing. Uh, second, uh, the both sides uh, should find uh, ways to communicate, not only those kind of talks, to uh, um, uh, set up uh, roadmaps of the conflicts, escalation, all those issues, which I have not seen. They are doing that, even the military to military. Uh, talks have not been restored. And uh, so that's uh, another thing I think they could do. Other than that, I don't know if if Professor Hoff Kaufman, I think you, if you want to have an optimistic uh, view, what is your reaction to this? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not an expert in this field. I'm an economist, but I do see Lots of lots of uh, means of cooperation, but the 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 theme of overreach uh, appeals to me. And you said yourself that China actually is not in the capable is not in a position to um, deliver the public goods that are implicit into Xi Jinping's world vision. Um, one one state of the world is that uh, the United States encourages that overreach because that's really uh, what what undermines China's strength in the end and and so uh, emphasizing you as the, the the security aspect of Xi Jinping policies and undermining the econ economy and that would in the end lead to to if you want a a, a situation in which the US 
would not be overtaken by China and, and would be more confident itself. So that could be a new basis for discussion. But I'm, I'm, I'm you, you hear I'm struggling here. So I'm, I'm moving to the next question uh, of Dr. Yu Hong. Uh, thank you, Professor Hoffman. Hello, Professor Zhao. Very nice to meet you again. You look very energetic as always, right? Uh, you just answer uh, to my colleagues' questions uh, about China's overreach. Uh, foreign policy goal, right? I guess this is part of my question, right? We now know, right, recent years, China's actually uh, announced several, you know, globally oriented initiatives. BRI is certainly one of them, but now you have the global development uh, initiative and global security initiative and global civilization initiative. But at the same time, you see there's many uh, serious challenges facing China at home, right? We talk about demography, talk about economic restructuring, talk about increasingly hostile geostrategic environment in the region and beyond, right? So I guess my question I want to ask you is that, do you believe actually China is now is the overstretched superpower? That's my question. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree with your point, Charles, overstretched, overplayed its hand. And uh, especially uh, after the zero COVID policy failure. And uh, many people uh, argue that uh, China is picked, I mean, China economic. Um, Professor Hoffman, you can correct me on the economic side. And uh, Chinese economy, uh, uh, economic growth is uh, picked. And uh, in that context, uh, uh, China is uh, in an increasingly uh, vulnerable uh, position uh, to uh, uh, compete with the US and uh, to carry out Xi Jinping's uh, great power ambition. But the problem here is that uh, I don't think China leaders accept that uh, um, position. China is picked, China is overreached, China is overstretched. And uh, still they believe uh, in the US uh, uh, is in declining. China is still uh, in uh, rise. Uh, they live in their own bubble, in fact. Uh, so that's the dangers of the current situation between China and the uh, uh, US and Chinese foreign policy. That's why we don't see China has making really uh, significant compromise at this point. And uh, when uh, Blinken with China, Xi Jinping said that they are like emperor, he's just like a, a vassal sitting on the table. And uh, so that's the situation not uh, good uh, for China at this, at this time. So maybe that is the, the, the positive um, trajectory uh, when the United States uh, finds itself, gains more confidence, invests in its people, R&D, basically the Biden agenda. When the Biden agenda succeeds, perhaps the, 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 this view of the West is declining and the East is rising uh, will change. And that, that would be a better basis for compromise. I think it would be a more realistic vision as well, but it would also lead to more compromise. Uh, in the we hope so. We hope so, but I don't think the U.S. is confident. U.S. now is very inconfident. Uh, that's correct, but that's why I say with <laughs> the success of the Biden agenda. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, the U.S. The U.S. We're not really discussing it here, but the U.S. may be uh, uh, at at its lowest confidence internationally, given its very aggressive tone vis-a-vis -vis China. Not so much in the administration, but more. Right. That's why U.S. is also the, overreacting. To Correct. China. All right. Dr. Saratong. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Zhao. Nice to see you online. Uh, I have two questions. Um, I am uh, like Bert, uh, I'm an economist, so very naive on the foreign policy. Uh, question number one I think uh, countries' relations or foreign, uh, foreign relations uh, have different aspects. Uh, and I want to ask, uh, in terms of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, foreign policy, 
in three areas, including military, party party, and diplomatic, which is the common one. Uh, is, uh, is there a difference uh, in terms of approach under Xi Jinping to conduct uh, his uh, foreign policy? So that's the first question in different areas that, that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that foreign policy is carried out or implemented through different areas, including military to military, um, uh, party to party, and then the diplomatic, uh, which is, uh, you know, that's the, the channel. Uh, question number two uh, is, uh, I'm interested in the policy formation, policy process um, in terms of foreign policy, foreign relations, uh, international relations, uh, who are the people who, if, if in case like Xi Jinping wants to gain understanding about this area, who are, is he going to turn into? I understand that he's less and less open to suggestions and, and recommendations, but are there institutions, uh, for example, universities, think tanks, or a research arm within the, uh, the, the bureaucracy? Uh, related to that is there is a sense of institutionalization of policymaking or, or uh, top leader dominated, dominated uh, policymaking, such as setting up party units uh, for various areas. What about foreign policy area? Are there similar things like the Commission for, for, uh, commission for Economics and, and so on and so forth? So that's uh, two questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, in my book, uh, I, in terms of the foreign policy making, uh, hierarchy and uh, intuitions. Uh, I have, uh, uh, as a policy making intuition, coordination intuition, and bureaucracy. In terms of bureaucracy, I divided into three uh, uh, sectors. One, the state diplomacy, represented by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, 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 Ministry of uh, Commerce uh, and uh, National Development uh, and Reform Commission and uh, Bank of China uh, Finance Ministry, all those kind of government uh, in, institutions, they conduct the so-called state uh, diplomacy in economic and uh, diplomatic political aspects. The second sector I talk about, those are very conventional uh, foreign policy uh, institutions. Uh, they are uh, role is th those are three. One was uh, to gather information. Second, to implement decision made by the policy making institutions. Third, to make po policy recommendations. So that are their roles. This um, second is party uh, diplomacy uh, conducted by the um, Central Committee International and the liaison department, United Front department, and the propaganda department. They distinguish their uh, foreign policy uh, operation from the state in terms of a state diplomacy conduct daily operation, daily diplomacy. They conduct more long-term oriented uh, diplomacy, try to tell the China uh, China stories, try to establish China's positive images in the international arena and correct those uh, misperceptions of China. So that's what the Western countries call the operation, influence operations. That's their function. The third uh, type is, uh, uh, third, third group is a uh, bureaucracy is uh, military uh, diplomacy and led by CMC, Central Military Commission. And uh, uh, for many years, I mean, th those uh, emerged only in 1990s. They organized uh, security dialogues, uh, ex joint exercise with foreign military and uh, military meal meal exchanges, many, many of those type of uh, military uh, uh, activities. Uh, among them, the most important part is uh, to support so-called coercive diplomacy and brinkmanship on the Taiwan issue, for example. And uh, uh, that uh, part of uh, uh, military diplomacy now has been 
very well controlled by Xi Jinping. For example, in my book, I talked about how the Ministry of Defense uh, has been weak weakened um, during 2018 uh, military, re and, uh, 2016 military reorganization, for example, the uh, International Cooperation Department is moved from defense ministry to the CMC, become the central uh, CMC International Exchange and Cooperation uh, 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 Department under direct uh, supervision of uh, Xi Jinping. So the military diplomacy has been also uh, um, very well uh, uh, organized, controlled by Xi Jinping. Other than the three government agencies in my book, I also talked the, the fourth naval, uh, which is at a societal level, uh, new players in the foreign policy making arena. The four groups I discussed in my book. Uh, one is, you, you mentioned the think tanks. Xi Jinping has called for new uh, type of uh, first worst cl world class, a new uh, type of uh, think tanks. Uh, second is those uh, uh, seasoned, uh, involved uh, netizens. Uh, uh, third is uh, media. Uh, fourth is uh, local governments. So those are new players uh, which have also uh, played a role in a foreign policy. I mean, try to get in, put inputs, also try to influence foreign policy making to advance their own interests. Uh, CDP has uh, done a very good job to uh, uh, incorporate those organizations. I use the term uh, uh, Mark and used. Uh, they are licensed in a, in, in a corporatist fashion into the foreign policy making process. If you are interested in reading my chapter or book on that. And then related to the second question you talked about, uh, who Xi Jinping goes to? In fact, uh, I don't think Xi Jinping goes to anyone. Everyone tries to go to Xi Jinping today. That is what see the government agencies, I mean, uh, think tanks, university uh, academics, everyone try to send Chinese uh, try to send policy recommendation reports. Whoever got the Pi Shi, I have an article in my journal and also in my um, book, I cited that, uh, got a piece, Pi uh, Shi. Uh, the comments or uh, endorsement from the Politburo uh, member, especially from Xi Jinping, would get very big promotion, get a lot of money. And uh, so that's how these people try to influence Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping selected only those he likes. And uh, these people also try to find out what is uh, Xi Jinping likes. So that's the problem of these uh, feedbacks, uh, information flow policy making process in China. The third question talked about institutionalization. I think my first two, the, my first answer, question, answer to my your first question already answered that institutional setting of foreign policy making. I don't know if uh, you agree with that. All right. Hmm. Any further? questions or comments from anybody in the Zoom? Well, if not, then what remains me is to thank Professor Zhao very much for your uh, great presentation. Clearly, um, we should all read the book. And, and uh, if you can buy the book, I will. <laughs> <laughs> get into the detail. Well, I'll, I'll first check whether the uni university library has one. Oh, we have. Uh, a, a final question, uh, Mr. Lim Min Zhang, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. I'm a journalist from the Straits Times space in Singapore. Um, I'm, I'm in Beijing now, I'm a China correspondent. Uh, I have a question on um, whether you can share some insight on China's foreign policy outreach towards uh, developing countries. So in my observation, China has been emphasizing South-South cooperation such as through the Global Development Initiative. And my question is, do you think China wants to be a leader of developing countries? And what are some potential pitfalls of, of that approach? And also, how do you think developing countries have taken to this idea um, beyond the material and economic benefits that have been offered to them? 
I will argue that China has been very successful uh, in the outreach to the global south, <coughs> part because of uh, out of necessity, the Western countries try to uh, confront China, try to decouple the uh, risk uh, from China, diversify from China, part because of uh, uh, the similarities of uh, China's uh, uh, development uh, uh, approach to those third world countries, uh, authoritarian and uh, centralization process, uh, and partly because uh, third part because of uh, uh, China has uh, focused on those uh, 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 material needs of the uh, global south. You even uh, uh, Lauren uh, Summer, Lauren Summers uh, argued that uh, a lot of third world countries, global south, uh, to America. Yeah, you are on the right side of history. Yes, we agree with your uh, democracy, human rights, but we need. A Pause. We need highway. China came to build highway. China came to build a uh, pause to build stadiums for us. So, what we can do? So that's the issue here for the U.S. And that's also the reason why China has focused and successfully focused on the global side south so far. I don't know if I I could uh, say what you said. China is a leader of the global south, but China has played a leading role. Uh, and also his foreign policy has uh, focused on, uh, reached out to the global south to in a competition with the US and the Western countries. I tend to agree with that judgment. Uh, <clears throat> China, at least on the surface, delivers what uh, uh, the countries in the global south uh, need for development. And China has been much more open. It's not just the building of infrastructure and other facilities, but China has been much more open on the trade side with those countries. And, and that, I think, makes, uh, makes a very big difference. I hope that Western countries learn from that, uh, including international organizations. All right, with that, Professor Zhao, thank you so much for presenting to us and for sharing your thoughts in your book. And indeed, I encourage everybody to buy the book or at least read it through the university libraries where, where available. Uh, thank you very much for spending time. I know it's getting late on, on your side. Thanks everybody for joining and everybody uh, wishing you a very uh, good weekend after today. Yeah, your side weekend, we have a Friday coming. <laughs> oh, it's, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.